Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wilson Zito. I'm a heart surgeon from University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Welcome to the SDS Roundtable. Today the topic will be Evolving Trends in Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement, or TAVR. I'm joined by an esteemed faculty panel here uh, to have this important discussion today. And I'm going to ask each one of you to introduce yourself. So uh, I'm Mike Mack. I'm a cardiac surgeon with Baylor Scott & White Health in Dallas. John Conti, I'm a cardiac surgeon at Penn State University in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Tom McGilvery, cardiac surgeon, Houston Methodist in Houston, Texas. Well, welcome everyone. So I'm going to start with a discussion and, and, and I would love to get everyone's perspective and I'll start with you, Mike. Um, the recent STS ACC TVT registry, uh, the trends of the volume of TAVR performed in the United States over the last two to three years as compared to open aortic valve replacement and AVR cabbage, there's been a tremendous change in the volume and the trend and trajectory. What are your comments regarding those numbers that we're seeing, reasons why, and what does it mean for surgeons in the future? So, you know, we have a number of randomized trials uh, in TAVR compared to surgery. Uh, and in all of those trials, uh, TAVR has been non-inferior to surgery. And any time you have two treatments in which the outcomes are the same and one in treatment is less invasive than another, uh, that treatment usually gets preferred by patients uh, and their referring physicians. And I think that's what we're seeing reflected in, in, in the marketplace, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. I think that the until 2016, the volume or the number of surgical aortic valve replacements stayed steady. But the lines crossed in 2016, and there's now more TAVRs done than SAVRs, or surgical aortic valve replacement, in the United States. And what we saw in 2017 in Dr. Therani's presentation is now, for the first time, the number of surgical aortic valve replacements going down. So uh, the two lines converged uh, in 2016, and now there will be a widening disparity. And this is with intermediate risk approval in early 2017, so I don't think we've even absorbed the impact of that yet to say nothing about low risk. Well, I, I think that really summarizes it nicely, Mike. I think we expected that. We think what's happened in the United States has mirrored what we saw in the European countries where they actually started with transcatheter valves before we did. So I don't think we should expect that it's going to be any different. The quality of the procedures that are done are far better than they were when we started out. There's less aortic insufficiency. Uh, pacemaker utilization has gone down. So it's a great therapy. The only thing that's constant is change. And I think that uh, we've got to keep our eyes focused on what the best thing is for the patient. And I think as Mike pointed out, the data shows that TAVR is non-inferior. And I think that patients vote with their feet. They want this therapy. And I think that the more experience that not just the study centers have, but the other centers have now and moving forward, the better it will continue to be and the better it will be for our patients. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, also, one point I want to make is risk profile. And I would love to hear the panel's thoughts. What we used to call high risk is probably not what we call high risk today. And what we used to call intermediate risk is probably not quite what we call intermediate risk. How do you think that has sort of factored into the trends as well? We've learned to risk stratify patients better. We, we, I've identified on the other spectrum futile patients, the so-called cohort C's in mm -hmm. the early days of partner. Some patients were just too high risk to even warrant any uh, type of therapy. As we get into the lower risk, what do you guys foresee as some uh, with a ceiling in terms of high risk and in terms of the floor for low risk? And, and then we can transition into bicuspid valves and concomitant disease. So, um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I'll start by saying um, if you think back to the early days of the partner trial that we were involved with, and you guys were involved with the, uh, you know, with the core valve trials, um, 
can you believe some of those patients we treated back no, then? No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, the average STS risk score in those was 11.5%. Yeah, Correct. And can you believe <clears throat> that we got 11.5% predicted risk with surgery, through surgery, with, yeah. with, a, with a mortality of 5.5%? You know, the ODE ratio was 0.5. We aren't treating those patients anymore. Correct. We aren't seeing them. And, you know, I think part, you know, there's a number of reasons why the outcomes of TAVR have improved significantly. You know, one of which is more experience, uh, um, you know, better devices, et cetera. But one is we figured out not only who to treat, but more importantly, who not to treat. And I think that's reflected in the trends that we're seeing as well. Correct. Not just, you know, pure, not, not just because of the availability of a new technology, but we also learn to be smarter with the new technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I agree. I, I think what I'm concerned about going forward is where is that, that basement that you talked about? Where is the line going to form where we should stay with surgical valves and we should tell a patient it is a great therapy, it will treat the disease as well as a surgical therapy, but we think a surgical valve is better for you and then what type of surgical valve? Where will mechanical valves fit into the picture? Mm -hmm. Many unanswered questions, but there are conversations we're gonna need to not only have with our cardiology colleagues, but we're gonna have to devise studies to uh, answer these questions. So I'm gonna use that to transition to a question to you, Tom. You're a busy aortic surgeon in, in Houston. Bicuspid valves, you brought it up. Um, there is obviously a lot of active investigation and interest from all of us, TAVR and bicuspid valves. What are your initial thoughts? Good, bad, more information? What about concomitant aneurysmal disease, especially as the risk profile of these patients are getting lower and lower? By definition, they're younger patients. So I think that's a good point, Wilson. I think that uh, some of the conversations that have taken place with the higher risk patients the higher risk uh, in part also because they tended to be very to higher aged patients. Mm -hmm. When you get into the bicuspid valve group, many of those patients present at a younger age. And so questions that still are not completely answered are what's the durability of these valves? What are the unintended outcomes of some of these valves over time? And I think that uh, different people have a, different opinions about this, but before we venture into a new therapy, I think some of those questions we should get answers to. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of the things to realize, even as we're in the low risk trials right now, mean age in a low risk trial is still 77. Right. So it's still an older patient right. population. Mm -hmm. I think as you move into the younger population, you got more bicuspids. And although you can do TAVR and bicuspids, the outcomes haven't been as good, you know, both in terms of paravalvular leak, LVOT, uh, calcium, uh, need for new pacemaker, et cetera, but they will get there. Um, <clears throat> the pacemakers have not, ha have for, for the most part been a benign thing. Mm -hmm. As you move into a younger pop population, they may not be so benign. Right. Yeah. If you've got to live 20 years with a pacemaker and all the complications of leads and things like that, and then who knows about this whole issue of valve thrombosis. It seems to be higher in TAVR than mm -hmm. SAVR. Yeah. And oh, by the way, it happens in both. If you're going to be on anticoagulation with that, why not go back to a mechanical valve? Right. You know, there's the California study that was just in the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago. It shows your survival is better above a certain age with, with mechanical as opposed to, or below a certain age, right. mechanical versus whatever. So I think it's a rapidly moving field. Correct. You know, another question is, are the devices we currently have approved and are in the low-risk trials, are they appropriate for bicuspid valves? It's a different disease. The bulk of the leaflet disease is far greater. Is, is it the, are they the right designs for a similar but different indication? Well, I think that's a good point, John, that I think we have to study it. I think it's, yeah. we can't make presumptions that just because these, these transcatheter valves have worked very effectively in one group of patients that they'll necessarily have the same outcomes right. with another group. Now, as the trend as you, has been discussed here, that TAVR will continue to increase <clears throat> for many other reasons we just discussed. What are your thoughts about 
future of cardiac surgery at number one, but specifically what are training programs and our training paradigm. If we want to continue to have surgeons engage and we want to continue to model the heart team approach, how do we best serve a residents to make sure they're prepared, number one, and number two, do we have the manpower? Do we have the manpower to be there with every single tab of when it's performed? Is that realistically achievable, let's say five, 10 years from now? So, so I think this is uh, our vascular surgery moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you can argue 10 years ago was our vascular surgery moment, but it's still our vascular surgery moment. Mm -hmm. We can either be part of transforming our specialty you know, there's still an attitude a little bit, well, TAVR's not real surgery, it's not big boy surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, but the vascular surgeons didn't take that attitude and look at that specialty today. It, you know, it's 90% endovascular for major a aortic procedures. I, I think that's the attitude we have to embrace and it has to be part of our, our, our training programs and not just a post-training fellowship structural year. Absolutely. I agree 100%, you know, I'm new at Penn State and we have discussed modifying our residency to specifically address manpower issues in the future. Will we be able to train our residents to fulfill the future roles of cardiac surgeons? And one of the proposals that we're actively discussing, and I think we will be proposing, is to have an additional year, where it's two-year program, go to three, but that final year will be a fellowship for those who want to do heart failure and VAD transplant type things, mm -hmm. structural heart disease where they are in the cath lab and they're better prepared to uh, use the technology that's been developed, or potentially robotic surgery and those type of approaches to structural heart disease. I think all programs will have to be able to provide the entire range of therapies that are available. And it's, as Mike said, incumbent upon us to modify our training programs to make sure we're training the residents for 2030 and beyond. I think as cardiothoracic surgeons, we're not defined by the individual procedures that we do. It's the philosophy that we have, is to take care of our patients with heart disease and continue to push the envelope to provide the best care using the best techniques and technology that exist. And I think that we, we, we no longer spend a lot of time teaching our residents how to do thoracoplasties, which were mm -hmm. important for TV. Heart surgery didn't go away after antibiotics were uh, eradicated a lot of rheumatic heart disease in the United States, all the issues with coronary artery disease. We just need to train our residents to, to use the techniques that we have and help us develop them in the future for what we need. I think that th there is a there is a, a na analogy here of what's happening in interventional cardiology now. So there is a second year informally, non-ACGME right now, and there's a lot of talk about making it part of the training, a second year of interventional cardiology. And it's divided into three specialties, mm -hmm. coronary revascularization, structural heart, and peripheral vascular disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we need to think the same way. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. day of the generalist surgeon, generalist cardiac surgeon cannot continue. We need to be super specialized in heart failure surgery, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, structural heart disease. Uh, and what I think we have sorely neglected is coronary revascularization. We right. should be having coronary revascularization specialists. I'm sorry, yeah. You know, so I, I think that's the way the training has to move is toward this super subspecialization model. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we really have a tremendous <coughs> opportunity here to rethink the culture of cardiac surgery and how we train a residents. We have many programs now, integrated six, four, three, five, two. We really need to use all the potential opportunities to best train our residents because at the end of the day, the most important thing we do is to take care of our patients. I think too, the uh, can't be overstated, one of the great benefits that TAVR has brought to the way we take care of patients is the use of the heart team. And I think that the heart team is and should continue to be rolled out into other aspects of heart disease. Sitting, having everyone sit down at the table with each individual patient, determine what the best way to approach that patient is. And it needs to be evidence-based. We need to use the heart team as an integral 
part of using evidence-based medicine to make the decisions. We have to eliminate parochial interests and make our interest, which we think always has been, the best thing for the patient, both short-term and long-term. Right. And long-term. That's an important part, not only of benefiting the patient's lives, but it also will benefit uh, maintaining a reasonable control of the health care costs. We have to be cognizant of that. We can't just go and do something short-term because it's less risk than surgery. We have to think about how are these transcatheter valves going to work 10 and 15 and 20 years down the road? And if we put them in that 48-year-old with bicuspid disease, are we going to not only jeopardize the patient's life by having to re-intervene once or twice, are we going to have to go and do something surgical at the age of 80 because we can't put another transcatheter valve in? So I think bringing people together from the different specialties is absolutely mandatory in all of our areas of uh, surgical intervention. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of resistance early on in the early days of TAVR to doing randomized trials mm -hmm. versus surgery. Why do we have to do a randomized trial? There's never been a r valve randomized trial before. Mm -hmm. And although that's true, I would argue that there's now been 8,000 patients randomized in the United States of TAVR versus SAVR. It is such a strong evidence base that I would argue it's actually accelerated adoption. Yeah, because, okay. you know, two specialties sitting down together looking at the data, it's hard to argue with such a strong evidence base. And to your point, John, that evidence base we need to continue to generate going forward. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. With all said, I think the trend is positive. Um, I'm optimistic about cardiac surgery. I think we're going to be uh, in a great state um, uh, in two to three, uh, in the next two to three decades. And I'm very optimistic. And I want to thank the STS for giving us the opportunity for this important, robust discussion. And I want to thank everybody for being on this panel. Thank, thank you for you having us. Thank you. Thank you.